Is everyone here? Uh, yes, why? Uh, yeah. Yes. Fantastic. Okay, so I'm going to uh, thank you so much for everyone. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to the Islamic courses um, in um, an interview with uh, uh, Professor Hashim Kamali. We're very honored and grateful um, that he can join us in talking about his life, his works, and thoughts. Uh, our host and presenter is Dr. Tariq Tamimi, um, who graduated from SOAS and who works at the Furqan Institute, who's going to be our host and presenter. So, without further ado, can I request everyone who is participating put, to put their um you can have your videos no problem but at the same time uh to put your um, um speakers or a microphone on mute we will have a question and answer session uh, opportunity for everyone so without further ado i'll hand it over to uh dr Tariq and professor Hashim Kamal. thank you Sam. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And uh, first of all, thank you, Professor Kamali, for uh, uh, joining us today and honoring myself with this interview. Uh, and I want to thank all the listeners, wherever they happen to be. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal that uh, we thank him, first of all, that he facilitated this means of communicating. This is a blessing from Allah Azza wa Jal. And uh, one way of uh, showing gratitude is to put this sort of technology to good use. So we hope that this is one uh, example of that. Uh, the other thing is, of course, uh, we ask Allah Azza wa Jal that he lifts this affliction from all of his creation, off in all of his creation. So uh, without uh, much, uh, if I can get straight into it, because the reality is that, uh, Professor Kamali, you are a, uh, a big name, an established name in the field of Islamic studies. Anyone familiar or anyone who has ventured into Islamic law or Islamic studies will have definitely come across your name uh, oh, and, and your writings. In fact, in one uh, line that I gleaned off Wikipedia, great resource, uh, it says here, uh, you have been called the most widely read living author on Islamic law in the English language. But the one thing I want to begin with, if, uh, if I may, is um, I want to take myself and the listeners uh, and, and yourself back some 40 or so years ago, you uh, studied in Kabul. You are a, 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 a Pashtun. Uh, you come from a region, from a, a province next to bordering Pakistan. And you studied in Kabul University before completing your master's and PhD in London. What was life like in uh, Afghanistan in the 60s? Okay, Afghanistan is... Uh is well known to be uh, a traditional society uh, among probably the most uh, practicing countries uh, that uh, are faithful to Islam and to its teachings. I was brought up in Afghanistan, went to school and university in that country. Um, my interest in Sharia in, in Islam began with my family background. Okay. I was born in a religious family. My father was a judge and also my grandfather. And the legal system in Afghanistan is mainly based on Sharia. So uh, it was basically our my family background and uh, the fact that I also had, uh, my father was uh, quite keen on educating me. He would wake me up early in the morning or after the prayer and teach me tafsir and hadith and Arabic. By the time I started schooling, I was well ahead of my, my schoolmates. And um, uh, so that, uh, that was the beginning. But later, when I also started writing and teaching, the areas of interest in Sharia study began to grow and develop. And, uh, well, uh, <clears throat> uh, how has it influenced me in many ways? I think if you do as much reading, and as much research as I have been doing, some of it penetrates in your thoughts and your personality as well. I think that uh, 
And there I stand in Islamic teachings and values that is part of my identity. And uh, it has grown uh, in different ways. Uh, and later I became a frequent traveler to conferences, mingling with people in different countries, all of them sort of bringing the kind of uh, combination of influences that I reflect in my writings and my teachings. And now I have, as you kindly said, I've become well known uh, in my own right. That itself uh, is uh, quite a new phase. I, um, I write and teach now in a way that uh, is different from 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, I'm the, I have the responsibility that people listen to me, people read me, so I have to be quite balanced in how I, um, uh, I introduce my, my views. You mentioned influences. Uh, you mentioned influences. I was wondering, are there a particular uh, set of scholars uh, in this, I mean, if we're talking about the 1900s, and in particular the, the late 1900s, we have a generation of uh, legal scholars who uh, are and remain uh, very influential on the Islamic, uh, uh, on the fiqh scene. So when we're talking about Mustafa Zarqa, or we're talking about Ali Khafif or uh, Sanhuri, would you identify anyone that you, in the 1970s, looked up to and said, you know, this is my model or this is the person, who would you say are your influences in terms of individuals or in terms of writings? I have been reading Al-Qaradawi's work uh, okay. a great deal, but I have read also uh, a number of other prominent scholars in my reading interest mainly in the area of Arab scholars, their works. Uh, Mustafa Ahmad al Zarqa from Syria, uh, Wahba al Zuhaili, for example, and uh, um, scholars from uh, different countries like uh, from Egypt. Uh, uh, I have been influenced by the writings of the Mufti of Egypt, Ali Juma, for example, uh, and uh, um, many, many more figures that in Islamic law, Islamic thought, Sharia subjects, generally on Islam. Uh, the writings uh, have been diverse. And I have been also reading in uh, Western scholarship. That is the kind of combination of uh, input in my own writing and understanding of Islam. Uh, what uh, do you think in terms of Qaradawi and uh, Wahb al-Zuhayli and al-Zarqa and the others you mentioned, what is it in particular that you would say attracted you to the writings of Qaradawi? I think Qaradawi's first book, Al-Halal al-Haram, was published uh, in the 60s. So was that, a, a, was that something that sort of uh, gen, you know, generated an interest in yourself? Well, he has uh, written uh, a large number of books over a a period of decade. He has also been changing sure. uh, over time some of his views, but uh, one of the quality of his writing is that he is lucid. Sure. He is direct and he is also in touch with modern <coughs> development. Like if you, uh, 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 Al Zarqa, for example, uh, his. Uh, uh, two volume work Islami fi Saubi Hil Jadid. Yes. Uh, that is a very well written work, I think, highly respected in the field. Uh, and uh, Wahba al Zuhaili, uh, he is, uh, uh, he covers the ground, so to speak. He's a textbook writer. That's right. Uh, his kind of uh, uh, influence is slightly different. He has written profusely and has done, you know, encyclopedic works. But in the meantime, I look at the Mausua Fiqhia of Kuwait, the Encyclopedia Fiqh of Kuwait, which is a good reference source. 
uh, in books of Abu Zahra, for example, um, I have been uh, reading and using in my own research. Um, and basically, many scholars, when I do research on a topic, I don't necessarily follow a particular name. I follow who has done work on that subject. Who has researched it most thoroughly, you mean? Uh, right. I wanted to ask you, Professor Kamali, you've mentioned uh, uh, these, uh, this uh, range of scholars, and I think, if it's, is it fair to say that one of the characteristics of these scholars is not only were they very much pragmatic, but they were from a new uh, generation of scholars who realized that the world has uh, moved on in such ways that we need to merge between uh, state law, law that, uh, that uh, exists in statute books and is implemented by uh, states as, and, and fiqh in the traditional sense. So this was uh, Zarqa in that book you mentioned, Al-Madkhil al al Am. He tries to say, well, how can we integrate our fiqh into uh, Syrian law? And similarly, uh, uh, Wahb al has, uh, you know, ventured uh, or taken steps in that direction. Do you think that, given that you are uh, a, a, a lawyer in, in many ways and your uh, concerns are very much pragmatic, do you think that turn, that turn towards integrating uh, our fiqh into a le modern legal systems is a critical one, is an important one, is one that uh, needs to be commended and continue? Well, that is, yes, that has been actually the main feature of development since the uh, era of Islamic revivalism, that the Sharia has been influencing legislation in some constitution, the Sharia becomes a requirement, and then influencing legislation, and uh, a great number of laws have come in many countries, starting with the reforms of Islamic family law, then we move to Islamic constitutional law, Islamic state discussions, and then Islamic banking, Islamic contract, Islamic finance. These uh, have been subjects that have been coming on stream uh, one by one and reflective of uh, the kind of uh, the, you know, the scenario that the FIFA is influencing actually statutory legislation and through that the behavior of states and leadership in Muslim countries in a way that is different. This is a more kind of, you know, uh, um, infiltrating parliaments and infiltrating uh, state institutions and the judiciaries. Uh, there is this phase of, you know, Islamic revivalism has entered a stage that from, you know, uh, being talked about the, mass, the masses, it's now influencing institutions, influencing leadership. And yes, the FEPA is responding to the practical needs, although the FEPA itself has been changing. And... Uh, each legislation in any country that takes from FECA also introduces, you know, subtle changes to, uh, to uh, compromise the realities of their society with the FECA uh, rules and requirements. Yes. You, you mentioned there uh, that FECA has been changing. You uh, completed your thesis in SOAS under uh, Neil Coulson in 1975, is that right? Yes. And the theme That's or right. the topic was uh, uh, matrimonial problems in Afghanistan, and then you focused on uh, marriage expenditure, uh, child marriage, polygamy, and divorce. And I was wondering if since then, it's been, it's been 40 uh, something years, uh, have your views changed? And do you think this work uh, as a follow-up question, has had any influence on the, uh, you know, on if, if it's focus of Afghanistan, has it had any influence on 
uh, Afghan lawmakers? Uh, yes, actually that book is now a, t a reference book in I Afghanistan. See. I, see. Uh, I see. Yes, Afghanistan, uh, it's been translated as well, but <laughs> Afghanistan is now quite familiar with English reading since the Americans and others uh, have been present in Afghanistan. This book is a textbook in uh, American University of Afghanistan and other places. Uh, but uh, uh, the sh interest in Sharia studies at that time was a little uh, specific, you know, uh, focusing mainly on family law. But as I mentioned, since then the Sharia kind of been expanding. The level areas of interest have been expanding. And we are no longer, the Sharia family law and the legislation that uh, introduced reforms were basically in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, and after that, the kind of uh, the reforms uh, that were introduced to polygamy, to marriage, to divorce, to other things stopped more or less. The hard core of the family situation like um, changes in inheritance and others still remain. Uh, but then uh, interest has been taken in other areas of Sharia and the uh, you know, Islamic law has been developing in different ways. Have you changed any of your views, any of the views you express in that work since? Oh, okay. I looked into you know, great detail into issues of uh, marriage and divorce in constitutions in Afghanistan. Well, the basic issues actually have, are still the same, but uh, maybe in one or two areas, if I were to write again, I was a little too critical maybe of this arranged marriage at that time. But uh, later I thought that uh, among the more enlightened and open families, although the parents uh, do influence, but uh, they uh, give the final say to their uh, adult uh, boys and girls. If that is the case, arranged marriage may not be such a bad thing as the parental influence bring a degree of maturity. So long as there is the element of compulsion is not there, otherwise I would not be against it now. So there is some development in my change of my own thoughts. But uh, otherwise those problems of marriage and divorce, polygamy, inequalities and uh, high expenditures on, and this and that on bride price. On, so that is still, still remaining. Thank you, Kamal. Thank you, Professor Kamal. Um, Mizan, are there any questions from the uh, audience that you want to bring in? Right, right. Sure. So what we can do, uh, Tariq, it's up to you. We can take questions on the chat or, um, or we can take, take it directly. I, I, I can't see the questions. So if anyone has them, uh, somehow forward them on to me. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> but what, so, why don't we take some questions from the chat? So if anyone has questions, please. Just, yeah, put them in the, the chat, chat, please, yep. and then uh, we'll carry on. Um, so Professor Kamali, if I can uh, turn slightly to more uh, in terms of your uh, writings. Now, we have the thesis, which was subsequently published. But I think if there is one work that you are best known for, it's the, uh, your principles uh, of Islamic jurisprudence. Uh, yes. I want to ask you, uh, that is a university textbook uh, written for the, whilst you were at McGill, is that correct? Um, no, I wrote it in Malaysia, actually. I came to Malaysia in 1985. Before that, I was teaching Islamic jurisprudence at McGill University. And the thought of writing a book actually uh, was there with me, uh, but I was busy doing other research. Only in Malaysia when I came uh, to teach uh, Islamic jurisprudence to uh, the International Islamic University. 
And I noticed again that this university is an English medium of instruction was instruction was English, but they do, didn't have a good uh, text in the English language. So I addressed myself uh, to that scenario. Uh, I wrote the book basically for my own class. <laughs> right. I did not think that it will be uh, a you know, world-class reader, although I revised it later. Uh, in 2003, but the substance of the book is the same, and that was yes, uh, it's uh, it was uh, my first book that uh, um, gave me, you know, quite a quite a name in the field. But since then, I've written about uh, close to 40 books, uh, and uh, some of them are thematic, uh, others, you know. On Sharia itself, I wrote two other books. One is uh, an introduction to Sharia law and introduction. Then in 2017, Sharia law questions and answers. Uh, and uh, I just more recently, I published a book in 2019 with uh, OUP uh, entitled uh, Crime and Punishment in Islamic Law, a fresh interpretation. Is, is that and, different to your previous book on the same topic? Uh, I, I had written one book that was published in Malaysia. Uh, that was entitled uh, Punishment in Islamic Law, uh, an inquiry into the Hudud Bill of Kelantan, okay. Kelantan, Malaysia. That book was specific to Malaysia and to Kelantan. But this book is much larger and it addresses uh, hudud in Islamic criminal law and punishment issues uh, in a, you know, uh, more widely for the world uh, wide audience. It's over 500 pages and it is quite comprehensive. Before that, I published a book uh, uh, with the OUP, again, it is entitled The Middle Path of Moderation in Islam. Uh, only now, recently, one book that is in press with OUP is uh, Halal and Haram in Sharia. Uh, that is, uh, no, Sharia, Sharia and the Halal Industry. Sharia and the Halal Industry. So this book is also uh, and the halal market and halal industry was really um, more market driven than knowledge driven. And I understood from practitioners and people that uh, we need the Sharia kind of input uh, to, uh, to guide the practice. Uh, like Islamic banking and finance, the halal study is also first market development take place and then we start writing. So it's, it's good if a substantial as a book is, is ready from an early stage. This will influence practice. So hopefully this book has is, is been, uh, uh, the reviewers has, have been strongly supportive and inshallah this will be another good book. Speaking of, uh, of books and of Sharia, guidance putting, uh, being put to practice, if we can hit two birds with one stone, uh, it is, I think, to your credit, Professor Kamari, that one of the earliest writings on Maqasid Sharia uh, in the English language was published by yourself. What does that sound? Right. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, and I was, uh, this is because uh, Maqasid is such an important area of the Sharia that is uh, yeah. almost uh, 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 sidelining the Usul al-Fiqh. Professor Kamali, uh, uh, yeah. if, if I may, um, Mizan, if you mute everyone, it's, it's, you can mute, uh, this. It's, the sound is coming from Cla Claudia Bulfoni. Yes, apologize. <laughs> I will mute now. Lovely. Professor Kamali, um, you were saying yes. that Makassar Shir is an extremely important topic. 
and and right. like I said, it's to your credit that you put it on in the you put it on the map for the English reader in many ways. I want to ask you, in terms of Sharia guidance and practice, how can we, given the coronavirus uh, crisis that we that all of humanity is um, suffering from, uh, how can we utilize uh, what some have dubbed maqasid thinking or maqasid oriented fiqh to uh, guide us in uh, the this current uh, in this current climate in, and i can if you yes. wish i can pose uh, one or two specific questions that are uh, currently uh, the, the being debated one of them is is this question of uh, when doctors are faced with a dilemma of limited resources but uh, patients uh, and, and too many patients this, uh, this idea of t uh, triage or t Arabic, in Arabic, tazahum. What guidance can maqasid oriented thinking offer doctors and medical practitioners in this respect? How are they supposed to prioritize which patient to give, say, ventilators to, uh, given the circumstances? Well, maqasid uh, is practical wisdom. It's purposeful thinking and purposeful action. Uh, and it does not really uh, tell you how uh, medicine should be practiced, but it does give you some idea where the priorities are. The priorities is protection of life. And um, uh, here even religion gives way in order to protect life. We used to go to Friday prayer, but the instruction has been that we should not go. Um, we uh, are taught by the religion to visit the sick, uh, but now because it is a contagious disease, we suppress that part as well. But when we say, we say that uh, protection of life is the first priority, our attention uh, is focused on that. And uh, whatever it takes, even if we have to make compromises. And there may be, the Makassid tells you not only protection of life, but protection of religion, protection of property, of family, and uh, of rationality. Now, there is a kind of an internal order between these Makassid, essential Makassid, that some may have to give way in order to prioritize the other. Now, whether it is property or whether it is, uh, uh, you know, some other aspect of the maqasid has to give way in order to protect life. That must be uh, the case. I think that uh, now the maqasid teaching will tell us that we comply and follow the instructions that we get from the professionals, from scientists and from government policy and leaders. Now the policy is uh, stay at home, uh, social isolation, and uh, um, you know, distancing yourself. And these are the, not the typical teachings of Islam, but now it's become the priority and we have to comply with it and act on it because these are in line with the maqasid of protecting life. You mentioned uh, the closing of the masajid. Do you have any, any opinion on uh, this idea of virtual Friday prayers or virtual taraweeh? Do I have what? A, a, an opinion or a position on uh, broadcasting Jumu'ah, uh, on praying Jumu'ah at home, say, or praying taraweeh? Virtually, so you have somebody, the imams leading you perhaps on the masjid, and the salah gets broadcast, and people are in their homes, and they can uh, be uh, follow the imam. Do you, do you have a position on that? Yes, I am. Uh, I am uh, supportive of it. It is the benefit of technology that makes that possible. Otherwise, we would be left with even um, you know not uh, uh, virtual. Um, kind of uh, uh, performance of Salat with the Imam uh, or the Khutbah, for example. If this is possible, and this is an advantage, and I 
I'm uh, altogether, you know, receptive of that. There is now no objection. If uh, technology can be used in such a way that it would promote uh, religious institutions, religious ideas in the practice of Islam, then so much the better. What, but would you say, Professor, that one of the core uh, elements of any maqasid-oriented thinking is a consideration for the long-term consequences, the idea of riayat al-ma'al? Would you not say that in this instance there is a fear that many jurists have expressed, jurists who disapprove of this practice, that they say in the long run this will lead to people abandoning the masajid or will lead to a laziness uh, in terms of attending masajid. They say, well, why do I need to bother going to Jum'ah and, and prepare and all the rest of it when I can just simply with a click of a button join Jum'ah at home? What, 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 what would you say to that? <laughs> I um, I go regularly to Friday um, Salat. In fact, the government order, the government has difficulty to uh, persuade people not to go to Friday prayers. Even uh, at the, even after the government issued orders, the Minister of Religious Affairs in Malaysia that uh, pray home on your Friday Salat people would still go to the, to the mosque. And then they had to, uh, you know, this is not the case they experience. Muslims, uh, they are quite, uh, you know, um, particular about this aspect of uh, the practice of Islam. Uh, my fear is not in that direction, that what you said, that it will bring laziness and so on. I think if it does bring, it will, Bring it will come even without this stimulus. But uh, I, I think people who are uh, religious, they will not probably be influenced in the long run over these developments. Thank you, Professor Kamari. If I may, I'd like to bring in one of the questions from the audience, which is, what has been the response to your works by more traditionally trained ulama who have studied in the madrasa system? And do you follow in your research a particular school of Islamic law? If not, then what would you call yourself and what do you think of the labels Hanafi, Shafi, and is it necessary to fall? So that's three questions in one, if you want to address any of them. What's been the response to your book? I, well, I ha I'm really um, interscholastic. I was born in a Hanafi country and family, but I have... Uh, moved. I have moved and I think Islam is not confined to uh, the Hanafi school. Islam is much wider and in my writing uh, it's typical that I start with the Quran and Hadith and then uh, the fiqh kind of coverage and this is different from the fiqh writing. If you look at Wahba al-Zuhaili and others uh, in the older fiqh book I was looking recently, where is the uh, Quran and Hadith in it? They start just telling you the fiqh provisions, but it's very important to keep contact with the sources. That is what I have done in, in my writing. I think that uh, the difference between traditional ulama and myself, I would not say it is wide. It is, I used to think that uh, maybe uh, we have a, a bigger gap with the ulama, but uh, I have started, I'm a founder of this International Institute of Advanced Islamic Studies in Malaysia. Uh, 11 years ago, I started it with the help of the government of Malaysia. And at, uh, in the, at some stages, uh, we had difficulty to bring in to our conferences in our uh, events, these traditional muftis and ulamas and scholars. But in the last four or five years, they have been coming. They have been coming. We have tried over the years to publish our work in so many different ways, um, and, uh, online, in, in hard copy, and so on. And uh, 
we have been writing to in the newspapers and so on. We have introduced ourselves uh, mm -hmm. and people know us that we are the mid middle of the road kind of scholars and that they also come and sit with us at one time they didn't. It's a question of how you try to reach and try to make yourself understood in an effective way to some extent. Yes, the gap between the traditional religious studies and modern studies, that uh, still is there. But I think there have been some good developments like the new Islamic universities, some of them in English language. And even earlier in universities in Azhar, they have been uh, studying modern disciplines uh, side by side with uh, traditional disciplines. Gradually, I think people are being influenced in both directions. <coughs> the modern academy and ulama listen more to the ulama and the ulama also to some extent this way. This is <coughs> perhaps uh, a benefit of the modern uh, education system, university system we are seeing. But there is a long distance to go. There, uh, the happy balance where you strike that, that is still some distance away. <coughs> In terms of uh, uh, a bridge between, say, traditionally trained ulama and Islamic studies, uh, Islamic law practitioners or graduates of universities, uh, one manifestation of that would perhaps be in Islamic fiqh councils, uh, whether it be the, uh, the, 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 you know, we have them across the Muslim world. We have several in, uh, in uh, the middle, in, well, in Saudi Arabia specifically, but of course we have them in India, you have them in Europe, and you have them in the United States, and you have them in, the, in Morocco and elsewhere. What is, in your opinion, uh, what is your uh, evaluation of the, the sort of uh, work these organizations produce and in what way do you feel that their work could be improved? Well, the organizations, I think like there has been Islamic Fiqh academies. Uh, there are two in Saudi Arabia. There are uh, in Egypt, in India, in uh, other countries, in Indonesia, in Malaysia. Uh, they have their own national fiqh councils or academies, but some are international. And uh, I've been looking at work of the International Fiqh Academy of Jeddah, for example. Yes. They do a lot of, uh, uh, they respond to issues of bioethics and Islamic banking and finance, medicine and uh, science and technology. Uh, one question like, uh, uh, human cloning, is it permissible in Sharia? Like, uh, you know, uh, uh, transplant, organ transplant and so on. Uh, they do research. They also liaise with science scientists. They ask the scientists to present a paper. And they ask the uh, scholars to write and do some research on this particular issue. So then they uh, look and uh, sit together and try to come up with a fatwa. This is, a, I think, it's a better approach than we used to have with the individual scholars. I think the collective ishtihad, ishtihad jama'i, <coughs> which is now uh, the mainstream approach of these collective bodies, institutions, academies, uh, this has the benefit of consultative input. And there is a greater assurance that uh, uh, errors, if there are any errors, they will have been corrected. And the research methods, they have also improved their research methods. So I think that I, I, I would say, I think more positively about uh, these, you know, learned uh, institutions of research, FECA academies, and uh, specialized bodies in some universities and other places. Uh, they, they, I think it's a better approach. It's a good approach. It uh, can also bring more people 
to uh, take their you know conclusion and their fatwas uh, and act upon them. What, what about this? Uh, one of the themes, I guess, of your writings is that these fiqh councils uh, are require some kind of uh, parliamentary recognition. I think that's the, the, the terms that you use. That the, they are currently they issue opinions, legal opinions, but these opinions are rarely, if ever, enacted upon or rarely enter the legal process. Uh, I'm not sure if that's an opinion you still hold, or what you know what you make of it. Well, I think that uh, there is a degree of uh, each country follow their own FICA council opinion to some extent. And there is also reason because I think that uh, the conditions and customs of countries also differ. Uh, and the FICA ruling of each country should, be, uh, should also uh, be informed by their culture and customs, the way you can understand that. And there is a degree of sort of, you know, uh, my situation is different to yours. But these international uh, FECA academies, the advantage is that they don't, na you know, they don't nationalize in that way. It, they look at Islam in a more objective and broader way which is a better way of looking at it. But I think that it is for different countries to try to recognize uh, the collective body and support them. In the International Fiqh Academy, they, uh, all the countries are represented, in fact. The OIC countries are represented. And sometimes they ask for uh, special additional scholars and special fields. Uh, so I think that that is a good development. Maybe there are, there is, there still need some wider recognition. And my own suggestion would be that we should try to, uh, to follow them and to recognize them and support them. Because I think that uh, Islam is not really national in that sense. Islam is uh, international, universal, addresses humanity and people rather than countries and particular nations. Uh, Professor Kamali, uh, you identified cloning and aspects of Islamic finance and uh, organ transplantation as issues that these fiqh councils have addressed. Uh, what other pressing issues do you feel require in your what you would call perhaps renewed it or refreshed it you had what issues that uh, in, in any field of any uh, aspect of life do you feel require new thinking refreshed thinking well i think if you look at the the works of these international FECA academies uh, two areas uh, are prominent. Uh, one is uh, <clears throat> bioethics and medicine. Uh, uh, like, uh, you know, as I said earlier, whether uh, the kind of certain operations or certain um, tissues of animals, for example, body tissues or organs of animals, maybe, maybe the liver, a pig liver, can it be transplanted into human being to save life? These are some, you know, fecal issues in, uh, and that require the kind of response. And those are the bioethics kind of also, uh, <laughs> like uh, uh, this uh, 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 certain types of food, like, like uh, uh, whether they are permissible or not, especially this, uh, 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 you know, um, that uh, FGM, the kind of uh, uh, food that uh, combine uh, certain aspects of, or, uh, of animals and plants and, uh, and come up with, uh, you know, uh, new products. Whether these are permissible or not, it requires a response, for example. And then you have these uh, 
non-ending sort of development in Islamic banking, in finance, uh, in contracts, in types of products, banking products, uh, uh, and uh, whether these are the question of riba and gharar and uh, um, the kind of, you know, the shades of riba that are being practiced. Uh, some aspects of the fiqh that uh, were earlier even permissible. Uh, we have come down hard on them and uh, declared them impermissible. Some like, uh, not impermissible, but discouraging. Like murabaha, for example, in Aina. These aspects of Islamic finance, they are now you know, being limited and certain other areas are developing um, a kind of reliance on debt financing is, uh, you know, debt is becoming a big, big problem. So uh, the Islamic transactions in commerce and banking uh, uh, are, uh, they don't rely so much and they they look at the real economy, the kind of transactions that involve the exchange, exchange of goods and services, not pure financialization. That uh, you know, uh, money made over exchange of paper. This is the uh, second. You know, this is another way to reba. Uh, so these sensitivities have been quite uh, pronounced and the scholars have been really in, engaged to find solutions. These two areas have been quite prominent, but I think uh, the human experience, society, in Pepe Council of Europe, in North America, they each have their own Pepe Council. They ask questions about the practice of Islam and those issues like uh, relating to whether it is fasting, whether it is uh, you know, citizenship, this and that. Those are other issues. So you cannot really say that it's one type of issue, depending on what kind of experiences are, uh, uh, you know, bringing out questions. Professor, you will be well aware that there is, like you mentioned earlier, there are all these universities across the Muslim world and non-Muslim world that uh, have uh, that produce graduates every year in uh, fields of Islamic law and Islamic studies. In your assessment, would you say that the research produced, say a PhD thesis, is an example of is would be tantamount to an HD, would be tantamount to ijtihad? Would you say a thesis produced on say one aspect of Islamic finance? is equivalent to what we could call in previous times in jihad. Put differently, would you say that a graduate of one of these institutes could rightly be called a mujtahid? Uh, yes, yes, they do. <clears throat> these masters and PhD research, they zone in on particular issues and they do very, very sometimes innovative research. And they may be called ijtihad fil masail, ijtihad al juzi. That is, uh, they are not absolute ijtihad. They do not qualify as independent mujtahid, but they do uh, look into those issues and come up with a great deal of good uh, conclusions. Uh, you might recall in the theory of ijtihad. And there are, uh, the mainstream theory is that a person person has to become a full mujtahid before he can practice ijtihad in any subject of it. But there is tajzi'atul ijtihad, whether ijtihad is divisible. A person who specializes in criminal law uh, practices ijtihad in that area, even if he is not uh, a mujtahid in, in hadith or in tafsir. Um, so ijtihad is divisible. And ijtihad is also um, mujtahid, can be mujtahid mutlaq, mujtahid fil mazhab, 
in mujtahid fil masai absolute mujtahid that is like the imams then mujtahid fil mazhab like uh, in every mazhab you have main figures like imam abu yusuf in al shaibani in hanafi in others and so on they uh, practice ijtihad in mazahin uh, within the mazhab then is mujtahid fil masail in particular issues i think in these theses can fall under this uh, category or ijtihad on particular issues Uh, Professor Kamali, just on that, or somehow on the periphery, I would say, we have a question here, which is that, uh, what is the minimum bar, would you say, for Islamic knowledge in a time of mass literacy and easy access to higher education? If we are saying that a university graduate, a PhD holder, could be called a mujtahid in a mas'ala, uh, I, I, part of me, I, thinks that that keeps the bar very low. Uh, I, my experience has been that many people in the academy who write and speak about Islamic law have a poor grasp of the Arabic language, have, uh, which is the language of the sources, have uh, little acquaintance of, I mean, even reciting Quran is a struggle for them in many cases. I wonder, I'm very, I personally am very, um, cautious about it, but it relates to this idea of democratization of knowledge, which ties in with the question that one of our... I'm taking, when I said that, I'm taking from, from grant for granted the basic right. knowledge of the Quran and Sunnah and also uh, the uh, priorities and issues of Ijma uh, and I think a general knowledge of Islam, even of Usul al-Fiqa in the theory of ishtihad, that the, a person who writes a thesis on an Islamic subject, uh, I take for granted that they have the minimum uh, knowledge of the sources of Islam and the ahkam, uh, hadith al-ahkam and ayat al-ahkam and what, you know, aspects of fiqh have been determined by general consensus I'm taking for granted that knowledge, that knowledge exists. Speaking of Usul Fiqh, Professor, in your book, you uh, draw on the works of a range of scholars, but it, the, the, I would say the general theme is uh, you have maybe three or four key works, uh, Badran, Abu Zahra, uh, and I can't remember the other, other one or two. Uh, and this is considered a modern usul fiqh textbook, one that renders the subject more accessible to the law student, let's say. Uh, this, is, this book does not represent any single madhab's approach to usul, correct? You wouldn't say this is a representative of the Hanifi or the, or the Mutakallim or the Ghayr Mutakallim, in fact, let's put it that way. You would say it's a blend of both, correct? Many, there are many. I think uh, Abdul Wahab Khalaf, written That's a right. book on Usul al-Fiqa. Uh, okay. It's very practical, it's very good, not very detailed. Abu Zahra uh, also has written a book on Usul al-Fiqa. Uh, and uh, uh, any of these scholars, I think uh, they have written books. Uh, Wahab al-Zuhayli has written, al-Zarqa has not written, but his book on uh, uh, the two volume work is also almost a book on uh, all aspects of fiqh, including the usul. Um, then uh, I think that uh, there are very, very good books on usul al-fiqh. Abdul Karim Zaidan has written Al-Wajiz fi usul al-fiqh, for example. And uh, uh, I, you know, uh, I have seen many, many books like uh, some Egyptian scholars, they have produced yeah. good works on other aspects of fiqh as well. I think we are quite well provided with quite uh, concise works of scholarship, easily delivered and also better classified. You can find the material easier. There are indexes, there are uh, uh, subject kind of, you know, uh, 
matter in the chapterization. So better kind of uh, 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 easier approach to fiqh in usul al fiqh has been taken and practiced in these. I need to go to the washroom for a minute. Sure. Okay. Can I? Absolutely. Do you want to pause the recording, uh, Mizan, or do you want to keep us going? Or I can't hear you, by the way. I cannot hear you. Okay, yep. So if there's any questions people want to write down or ask Tariq, they can directly. Please don't hesitate. We've got about a couple of minutes before the respective professor comes back. Sure. Um, Apologise, I know people saying the camera is not very um, angled correctly. Um, professor's working from home. Um, he's using his mobile phone. Yeah, he's using his mobile phone. So if there's any feedback, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, um, we're going to try and work, you know, with future sessions, we're going to try and improve. This is, a, in many ways, a test drive uh, for the everyone listening in. Salaam alaikum, by the way. Uh, this is a test drive, I guess, and Mizan put it on me. Um, and I to reluct reluctantly accept. Um, but we're, we're sort of, the themes are uh, life, thoughts, uh, sorry, life works, ideas. We've kind of touched upon um, a range of things, I guess, with respect to that. Uh, we have a professor video. back now. Perfect. We've got another yes. half hour. Professor yes. Kamali, you were yes. speak, uh, this, uh, you were saying this work and other works similar to it, written in the modern period, uh, are uh, very accessible, which is absolutely true. And I have a bunch of questions in relation to that, to be honest with you. One is, uh, <coughs> this work is the work that blends both mutakallimin and the mutakallimin methods of uh, towards usul. Now. Would you say that there is any scope for the uh, to extend that to extend this uh, uh, this approach uh, or this method of compiling a work to include, say, Shi'i, Ibadi, even Jewish, and the, I mean, you work a lot on American uh, well constitutional law and the drawing up of constitutions and the amount of the number of parallels between the way we approach and interpret texts and constitutional interpretation is phenomenal. So why I wonder, do you think there is any scope for a sort of major big work, a compendium of sorts, where we draw on the legal traditions of other outside Sunni schools and also of other, other legal systems? I would say that, yes, yes, you know, Islam is you probably recall the hadith, Utlubul ilma wa laukana bisseen. Seek knowledge even if it is in China. China was not even a Muslim country. But if we can learn, there is also a hadith that al hikmatu dwallatul mu'min. That hikmat wisdom is the lost property of a believer. Wherever he finds it, he is entitled to it. So Islam is really uh, quite open. Uh, to uh, influences, good influences. Uh, we can take from other sources, but we do not dilute ourselves. We must retain our own identity and our own the integrity of our, uh, uh, <coughs> you know, the Sharia. Uh, but we can take from other sources. We can, in fact, what you said that the Shia in Ibadi in other they have gained recognition in 20th century some encyclopedias and they include all the four mazhab and then the Shi'i and the Zwahiri and other Ibadi. Uh, there is this openness. I think we have opened in many ways and not sufficiently perhaps. I am very supportive of Muslim unity, especially building bridges between Sunni and Shia and they have also their problem with uh, extremism, like the Shia, the Gullat of Shia, they don't approve them. But I think that uh, we uh, need to work for Muslim unity. And that means that uh, uh, we should really uh, recognize uh, the, the differences we have. But as far as I know, all the pillars of Iman, all the pillars of Islam, 
between Sunni and mainstream Shia are the same. There are differences in Fiqh, but there are also differences in among the Sunni Fiqh, you know, Mazahib. I think that uh, uh, we should uh, uh, try to reach out from other traditions. Uh, we uh, do not mix the Aqidah with the other, uh, you know, Jewish and other Christianity. But in terms of the Fiqh subject matter, Ahkam, Amaliyya, for example, yes, I'm supportive of it. If we can benefit from the comparative kind of, you know, approach, uh, we should have been supporting it. We are supporting, and there is basically no objection to it. Professor, you know, uh, in, uh, in fact, in your book on principles of usul al-fiqh, uh, uh, one of the adilla, one, one of the evidences for uh, that a faqih, or that a mujtahid, rather, faqih, mujtahid, I'd say the same thing, uh, ought to consider is shara' min qablana. And uh, this is even, and, and then this is what brings the question to the fore, I guess. When I look at how uh, Jewish scholars interpret their writings, uh, Jewish legal scholars interpret their legal writings, and then I see the similarities. And then you read, uh, I think, uh, uh, Iman and other scholars have written on this, the idea that at one period in time in Muslim history, uh, Jewish scholars would sit in the uh, circles of Muslim jurists and would benefit from their method of deducing and deriving the law. Uh, I think Given this idea of this delil that exists among the many adilla uh, that an usuli ought to uh, employ, that there is even a, gr uh, a more reason, perhaps, to include th these, uh, to see how others do it, how others reach their legal opinions, bearing in mind that we have our own unique sources. Um, right. But I just, the idea really, uh, if we have comparative usul al fiqh, uh, uh, not comparative, sorry, if we have a blend between the Mutikalim and Remutikalim methods, why can't we have a, a even broader comparative usul fiqh? I think if you look at the Quran, as you mentioned, there is a, a healthy recognition of the previous revelation, uh, the revelation preceding Islam, Judaism, Christianity, and the Quran speaks, you know, supportively of them. And there is also in detail areas of whether it is uh, uh, the area of Qisas or in areas of inheritance and so on. Uh, we have taken from the previous revelations. And I think that uh, this, uh, in principle, the Quran uh, opens this. Uh, later, the Fuqaha reach the conclusion that the Sharia of Islam has become self-contained. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, Fuqaha have made some claims, sometimes claims have been made that the door of Ishtihad has been closed and that this has come to an end and so on. We, we, we take them that they were good for their time, but I think our times are changing. And then the area, area of globalization, for example, oh, even in Britain, the Archbishop of Canterbury at one time uh, said that uh, in Britain, some aspects of the Sharia may be recognized. And if that uh, is spoken in that light, uh, Sharia is now mainstream subject. At one time, 50, 60 years ago, it was a kind of, you know, uh, sideline. But uh, now it is no longer. And it is uh, the kind of Islam is in the, you know, uh, in the forefront of the people's kind of attention. And there may be um, <coughs> ways of uh, uh, borrowing from different uh, traditions, some aspects that are good for Muslims and some aspects of Islam that are attractive to others. This should never be discouraged, provided that we do not really use that as a way of uh, uh, kind of, you know, uh, undermining uh, the integrity of the tradition itself. Professor Kamali, uh, thank you for that. You touched on a very important question, which is um, this notion of the closure of the doors of Ijtihad. Now, in one of your, in your Sharia book, 
uh, you say another problem we face at present is that despite the door of Ijtihad having been declared wide open, we do not see any effective movement towards making Ijtihad an engaging process of law and government. What would you say are the major hindrances to the activation of Ijtihad or the act or activating Ijtihad? Oh, well, I think that uh, uh, Ijtihad has become active. I think one of the things that is attributed to Muhammad Abdul Rashid Raza and uh, their mentor Jamaluddin Al Afwani, they issued this clarion call that the, Ijtihad, the door of Ijtihad is open uh, for a whole, whole century. We had that Ijtihad declared open and it has been practiced i think it also been practiced it's not the case that we do not practice ishtihad when we talk of the uh, fiqh academies and their fatwas on um, human cloning or islamic banking and finance all of this is ishtihad and it is continuing and coming in very uh, significant ways what i was saying that it has not been uh, been the mainstream practice uh, in a significant way, like uh, we still have problem with uh, like the constitutions of Islamic countries and Muslim countries. They hardly mention Ijtihad. There is no recognition of Mujtahid or Ijtihad because these are still the constitutions are still borrowed constitutions from Western countries and models, and I think that there is not enough effort to uh, bring in and recognize Ishtihad as an institution that carries uh, recognition in Parliament, for example, in other uh, professional bodies that practice uh, fatwa and Ishtihad they should be recognized. That was at, at that time, I think, my, and that is still the case, that Muslim countries should recognize Ijtihad as a mainstream practice. And Mujtahidun, we don't know who are the Mujtahidun in any particular country. We have not institutionalized Ijtihad. Like uh, uh, Abdul Wahab Khalaf suggested that every Muslim if uh, universities and learned uh, institutions of learning train lawyers and jurists, they should also be able to train Mujtahid and give and certify their status. And then they can be recognized. And when Ijtihad is needed, he can be called upon. <coughs> so these are the kind of you know, works we still need to do to institutionalize Ijtihad Maybe these uh, Africa academies have done part of that institutionalizing. But I think that in the constitutions and the laws, um, we take, we rely on Sharia. The laws of Afghanistan, I know, 90% are taken from Sharia. But the state organization, they don't sort of speak of Ishtihad. The official language is not a kind of a familiar language. So uh, we are making, I think, progress. Uh, some of the challenges that were there gradually, gradually, it will take maybe one century, 20th century. So, you know, uh, perhaps uh, we are coming maybe in a few decades, hopefully that Islamic revivalism is really uh, becoming substantive. It's no longer kind of the superficiality. And we will reach, I think that uh, you know, we will recognize a place for Mujtahid, for Ishtihad, for Sharia, in the institutions of state and law and, and learned organizations. I'd like to throw in a, a question here on the question on the issue of Mujtahideen. Who would you say are the greatest, it's a, it's a who would you say are the greatest or the most important mujtahids of this era? Oh, I think there are many. I mentioned some, uh, like Al-Qaradawi, for example, like 
uh, in Egypt, Ali Juma, for example, uh, the um, Mufti of every country in Malaysia, you can name, and other Muslim countries, the Grand Mufti, you may name, perhaps uh, uh, also that, uh, uh, like, uh, there are people like uh, uh, Salim al Awa, who is very competent, very prominent. He's a modern looking lawyer, but he is, you know, a much the head in, in, in his writing, in his scholarship. And I think that uh, um, we need to um, look for them. I think in Indonesia, they have Majlis El Muan Indonesia. In Malaysia, the uh, Minister of Religious Affairs, Al Bakri, <clears throat> he is a very learned person. I think that we do have, but uh, we have not really sort of, those members of the International Fiqh Academy, a lot of these prominent names uh, are still there, I think, uh, uh, sitting in, in the academy. They are all mujtahidun of different ranks, you know. Uh, was Salim al Professor Mohammed Salim al a colleague of yours at university? Because I think you guys finished uh, PhD together, or he may have finished just before you. Both of you studied under Kulsa. Who is which colleague of mine? Huh? Uh, Professor um, Muhammad Salim Awa. You mentioned him as a as a, a mujtahid, uh, you know, one of the great mujtahideen of this era. He did his PhD at Saras too. I think he did it maybe slightly before yourself or around the time you were doing it. Were you friends back then in the 70s? Well, I think I mentioned Salim Alawa. He was at Soas just before I met him. I met him. He was there a few months before uh, I started. He graduated. So he is one. And I think that, uh, <clears throat> uh, oh, when you, when you want to think, you don't remember them. But I'm sure that <laughs> uh, there are people who have become prominent and they have, uh, 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 but I think at so was my professor was uh, Professor Coulson. Uh, uh, he was a learned man and Professor Anderson was, but he was, it's a condition of a mujtahid to be a Muslim because his word is followed uh, by Muslims. So he should be a Muslim. But I think that uh, uh, there are many, many very learned people, uh, people uh, we read uh, their works, for example, they have, uh, whether it is uh, uh, Abu Zahra or Abdul Karim Zaidan or uh, Al Zuhaili has passed away, Al Qaradawi, Zarqa, uh, other Zarqa, and they are, uh, uh, I think they, they qualify, they qualify. You, re, you know that mujtahid are not all in one degree. They are different kind of, yeah. uh, Speaking of the mujtahid having to be a Muslim, you said because his words are taken. Uh, if, uh, is it a matter of trust that we cannot entrust a non-Muslim to issue a legal opinion on behalf of God, which is essentially what a fiqh is supposed to be doing, uh, because he doesn't believe in God. Is that what uh, where it comes? Well, is that the the logic behind it? I think on purely, <clears throat> you know, practical <coughs> issues, on purely practical issues, on which there is no issue of akida or uh, involved, like. Uh, you ask a question of scientific aspect and uh, the person who is learned in fiqh and science and says something, well, we value it, we, uh, we can recognize it, you know, as a kind of ishtihad, but it would be become, you know, um, a valid ruling of ishtihad if it is endorsed by uh, fiqh council or a fiqh academy and uh, if that person is sit among them uh, and his view is taken uh, that will be I think that on purely scientific 
fiqh kum science subject. We can recognize it. That's and uh, what I said about the, I think we should draw a line be between maybe uh, 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 subjects of aqidah and akhlaq or ta'abudi subjects in that area, the words of mujtahid uh, are followed. But in practical amali matters, I think that to whoever speaks of knowledge and uh, speaks from a position that, uh, you know, can uh, has reached the caliber and competence to so deliver uh, an original ijtihad, we should recognize it. Uh, Professor Kamal, just so I understand and the, the listeners are clear on this, if we say that ijtihad can be segmented, in, it's, it's a very relevant question to what's going on now. If, we, if jurists uh, were to consult uh, non-Muslim doctors and they were to reach an informed opinion on a matter, do you think that even if they are non-Muslims, their opinions, their medical opinion, ought to be taken into consideration. Is that, uh, have we yes. got this? Oh yes, yes, no question about that. The FIFA academies uh, may take their views into consideration and they make it a part of their fatwa. There is no question about that. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Going back slightly to- I would, I would, I would still, Look at if we have a situation where a Muslim, mujtahid, or faqih uh, can contribute uh, the same kind of caliber of uh, opinion uh, uh, as some other non-Muslim. I would prefer to take the Muslim. But if there is no specialist in one particular area and only a non-Muslim is a specialist, who also have knowledge of fiqh, his view can be taken by the fiqh academy and, and considered. Uh, professor, one of the issues that some people may have with these academies and these councils is that they tend to be state-sponsored. So what extent uh, can we, uh, can they maintain unbiased opinions? Well, I think that uh, when they sit together uh, among themselves and they represent 57 countries, I think that the bias element on such a body uh, may be marginal. Uh, I think that it's a, huh? What about yeah. the domestic but ones? The existing ones. No, the domestic ones, the ones that say in Morocco you have a particular body in yes. Algeria and so on. Right. I think the state influence is strong. The, the muftis are now, uh, you know, uh, part of the bureaucracy and the imams and of mosques also, they take salaries. And uh, uh, sometimes we hear that the Ministry of Religious Affairs send their khutbah to them, what to say, what not to say. And this is a problem. This is a problem and it's not our own problem of this in history as well. Even from time of Abbasis and the uh, Mayas and Ottomans and so on, the state had been influential. But I think that uh, um, these international fiqh academies are probably a little more objective. The national ones, I think it will be difficult to say that uh, uh, <clears throat> state influence is insignificant. But I would have thought that the state influence is not always misguided. Sometimes the state, you know, uh, policy is also the kind of thing that you would like to have. Professor, if I could, um, we were kind of running out of time, and I wanted to take it back to yourself. Um, looking back at where you were when you started this journey, where do you, where did you think it was going to lead you? Did you ever envisage um, the position or the recognition that you have you have now? What 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 did you have in mind as a, you know, a twenty year old year old student back in 
1970. What would be on our, my, my mind to tell my student, huh? No, no, look, uh, well, that's a question we can take. What advice would you impart to current and future academics? That's, we, we, you can, you, you, you're more than welcome to answer that, yes. Well, I think that uh, it's uh, what I would advise others would be to, <clears throat> one is if uh, how one can uh, try to be objective, avoid to be influenced by politics and so those things. And the other is that uh, to strike a balance between traditional learning in modern uh, learning, modern subjects. And I think that not to be a literalist, a textualist, uh, it's like some tendency among ulama might be, but uh, to be a man of the people. I think the scholar and ulama of yesterday, even today, they don't sit like with the young people, with women, with other groups, uh, but they keep being judgmental. They denounce them. They say they have lost their ways. And the, there was an occasion, in fact, uh, uh, I was sitting as Constitution Commissioner at the Constitution Review Commission of Afghanistan. And uh, we would ask groups of people to come and uh, sit with us and to tell us what would they advise us on the new Constitution. And the ulama of Kabul came. The Sunni ulama came, the Shia ulama came. The Sunni ulama, 15 of them, they came. And they advise us about the women. They have lost their ways. They have become this and that. We should uh, come hard on them. And I kept quiet. Everyone kept quiet, 32 of us. And I spoke at the end. I said, actually, I am disappointed for the kind of advice that you give. Uh, you know that women of Afghanistan are uh, really, uh, they are uh, hard hit by these, you know, patriarchal customs and inequalities. I would have thought you would advise us to uh, try to address some of those, these, you know, um, uh, tribal customs and so on. And you went the other way around. Uh, this was the kind of critique that uh, of, I would make of the ulama people. That I asked them, have you sit with the women, spoken to them? How many? Who have you sit with these people you articulate and advise us about? And they didn't have any answer. I think that the scholars should engage with people. They should try to take their cue from the people's experience rather than, you know, being judgmental over. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I guess one of the, if, if you are a lawyer or uh, occupied with the fiqh, one of the, uh, one of two aspects that you must be cognizant of is the relevance that, uh, of what you're saying and the practicality of it, the consequences of it, and also to have a full uh, acquaintance or a familiarity with the situation that is, that the person, the people are facing in order to issue a sound fatwa or to issue a sound legal opinion. It can't be issued from a, from a distance, as you, as you sort of uh, mentioned there. It's a condition of a fatwa, simple, simply put. I didn't get your question. Is there a question? No, I was just uh, underscoring the point you were making, which is that you said that a, a, a mufti needs to be a man of, uh, a man or a woman uh, of the people and uh, that in order for a fatwa to be sound and to be acceptable, it needs to, uh, the mufti needs to be aware of the situation he is facing in its uh, intricacies and details, and also the consequences. In other words, he needs to be aware of the yes. condition of the people he's addressing. Uh, but, Absolutely. And I think if there's anything you may, I'm not sure how much you concur with this, Professor, but there is a problem in uh, too much theory, too little application, but also too little training, too, too little legal training of many graduates 
uh, of uh, whether we call them traditional institutions or conversely of modern universities, that you are a graduate, but that does not necessarily uh, equip you or uh, allow you to issue a sound fatwa yet. It's, an un it's a process that takes a long, long time to, uh, to get right. Yes, I think that uh, <clears throat> um, I have been uh, very conscious of how to uh, be close to people's conditions in every society I've lived and made that part of my research, my study. Every book I wrote is a learning experience in itself. And I think that uh, um, uh, I work uh, now with some uh, committees in Afghanistan on issues uh, that has become an area of my interest. I have started an institute of Islamic research. I'm uh, training researchers and so on. And I am uh, involved in how to make a researcher also a person who is uh, in touch with the topical issues and problems of society. There is this kind of uh, still, not only traditional ulama, but uh, the modern PhD students, they are uh, have theoretical knowledge, but they have not engaged with the actual problems, even in their areas enough to deliver solutions. I think this is important that uh, uh, scholars and researchers, they don't become theoretical, but they also engage uh, and work with people and sit with them and visit them. And each of these experiences bring a new kind of uh, input to their, how comprehensive the end result and their conclusion of their work can be. Uh, Professor Kamali, I want to round up with one final question. Uh, uh, you know, there is this, uh, there's something called the Desert Island Discs in, on the, that gets broadcast on the BBC. Desert Island Discs. And one of the questions that any host gets asked is, what, uh, you know, what books would you take with you if you're on an island on your own? And I want to ask you, Professor Kamal, if you happen to be on an island just on your own, what books would you carry with you? If you give me a three or four titles, perhaps. I think uh, Mahmoud Shaltut wrote a book, Al-Islam, Aqeedah wa Sharia. I think uh, that, that book is a very good book. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, I said that uh, on any particular area, like, uh, like uh, Al-Qaradawi's book, Al Khasais Al Sharia Al Islamiyya. That is a good book, for example. Uh, there are uh, books, I think, by others uh, like uh, Abu Zahra, like uh, uh, on, on uh, Usul Al Pekka, but also on Muhammad, uh, like uh, many writers. I mentioned Zarqa's book, that is what I will take with myself. <laughs> Very interesting. Abdul Karim Zaidan's book, Al Wajiz, Al Usul Al Fiqh, and I think two or three other books. They talk about uh, this Qawaid Kulliya Fiqhiya, Sharh Al Qawaid Al Kulliya Al Fiqhiya. And uh, I think uh, you know, one of Wahba Al Zuhaili's books, uh, Al something that uh, Al Fiqh wa Al Fikr Al Maasir. Very big book. Something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, it's yes, yes. I can see it's uh, the evening where you are, Professor Kamali, and I don't wish to take up any more of your time. I am honored that uh, you've uh, allowed me to uh, host this interview, uh, and uh, I am uh, uh, very much appreciative of the experiences and the knowledge that you have uh, shared with us today. And uh, I just want to say a big thank you from myself and from on behalf of the uh, the audience here. And I wish you uh, uh, well in the future and and further contributions to this to this field. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I once, hope it has been useful. Once again, thank, thank you, you Tariq, for being a fantastic host and presenter, well, and Professor. Hello. And inshallah, uh, we pray for you and for your health and you can continue your, your great work. Um, we're all students. Uh, we benefit inshallah. massively from your, uh, your subjects and teaching. And, and folks, just to let you know, please tune in for the next session on Saturday and Sunday. Saturday we're doing on Coronas and environmentalism and on Sunday we have something with Jonathan Brown and, and uh, Ramon Hardy from Justice and Islam. And we have some more titles coming up on Zoom. So if you don't know the details, just send us an email, info at islamiccourses.org. Uh, these are all free sessions. But once again, we, this is a record, it has been recorded, so I'm going to get, send it to the professor and to uh, City Maria as well. So and once it's approved by them, and if we're allowed to, we can put it on YouTube. But it's all dependent on. And also, please do purchase Professor's books. Please go to the, uh, uh, the website. It will send you details where you can purchase his books and his thoughts. Uh, and, and, and you can see some Actually, of on, on the on the issue of books, if I may, I often recommend the, for beginners, I always recommend the Sharia, an introduction book. And if you see a pristine example of research, I recommend the Islamic commercial law book uh, because that is a thorough and very relevant study of a of a particular uh, certain particular aspects of uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Islamic law, Islamic financial law, and the Hadith studies textbook is a marvelous contribution to the English language uh, and very accessible too. So these are three recommendations for myself. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, salam alaikum.